It's been a while on this channel, and today I'm uploading a video from the comfort of my living room, sitting on my body pillow with the fire, and a nice cozy living room where I live here. And it's reminiscent of some of the fires that I've enjoyed while wandering through the back annals of the mind on mushrooms or other substances. And since I'm not sure what YouTube allows as far as discussing these things, I should start with this disclaimer. Uh, this video is intended for adults. I have marked it adults only. It is also intended to be for harm reduction, the understanding of the use of these substances, the benefits and risks of said substances, and I believe that a free press also includes uh, the freedom for individuals to discuss their experiences that they've had. So this would be more of a, uh, a customer, you know, <laughs> a customer review, if you will. And this fire is getting awfully warm, but it sure is nice. Now, uh, when I was younger, and this video is really intended for me to go over my drug history in hopes that I can save a few people from making some of the same mistakes and for others to maybe take a different position on where they're coming from on their own use of these substances. I've used just about everything, okay? I mean, I was a kid once. This long hair doesn't come easy, you know? I started growing my hair out when I was 16 or 15. I was well, I had a mullet when I was 14, and then grew a long hair up until I was about 20, then I cut it. And I just recently grew it back, but the point is that when I was younger, I kind of went through this secondary hippie phase. I was introduced to psychedelics in the, uh, let's see, it was about 1990 90 or 91. And I was also introduced to dimethyltryptamine and cannabis, of course, uh, but the others didn't come long after that. And while a lot of people were doing uh, methamphetamine or cocaine, I was, you know, doing psychedelics. My outlook on life became one of hope, one of understanding, one of triumph with man and nature and a connection between all things before I could even realize what was happening. And these experiences were so insightful for me that I still draw on them to this day, watching a sunrise after a wild, you know, psychedelic journey. So I should start off with how I got to where I am now. When I was 14 years old, I was introduced to cannabis. Before that, when I was about 13 and I was in junior high, my uh, counselor came and she said, I want you to go to this drug class. And it was eighth grade and they would teach you all about the different drugs and how dangerous they are. At that time, I had no interest in substances like that. My parents smoked pot, but I didn't even care. I wasn't interested in alcohol or anything else until I was put in this class and I was introduced to these other people. The next year, I tried pot for the first time. Nothing. Tried it again. Holy crap. It was an amazing experience. Ever since then, I've been in love with cannabis. This was about 1990. So it's, you know, uh, been 30 years. And uh, there have been times where I quit for a year or quit for two years uh, because I was having legal issues, but beyond that, I've always enjoyed cannabis, and it's never been a big issue for me. It's been, and but for other people that I knew, uh, their parents sent them off to drug treatment for smoking pot once or twice. They didn't know how to handle their, you know, the situation, so the kids got worse and worse. And um, so, once I was introduced to psychedelics, it changed my mind forever. I mean, I took them when I was maybe 15, 16, we got a hold of these, you know, LSD, and we took about three each. And then there was a time when I took six of these really strong tabs. It was about when I was about 19. So there was a five-year period or so. And uh, that experience was so intense that I decided to not do it again for like a decade or more. I was just not interested. But that 
coincided with the time when LSD kind of disappeared off the market anyway. So, back to my situation. After I'd tried these substances for a year or two, I was introduced to something else, which I don't want to name. Um, a substance that is rampant uh, in uh, yeah, uh, the, the amphetamine world, as well as the cocaine world, are places that you never want to visit. You know, amphetamines have their use in medical. You know, a person who is seriously, seriously depressed or down can maybe benefit from a, a small boost. Cocaine was great for medical, medical use and whatnot, but beyond that, these drugs that just flood your body with your brain and body with dopamine, they do nothing but make you want more. And they are some of the things you want to stay away from more than anything. And these are the same drugs that are in Schedule 2 or 3. While cannabis, a benign plant, is still, to this day, in the federal <laughs> drug you know, classification, Schedule 1, the most dangerous, along with psychedelics, which LSD, nor mushrooms, nor cannabis ever kill anyone, other than something that may happen while a person is on them. So, back to my story. I was introduced to these after a friend uh, perhaps just broke into someone's place, somebody that knew someone, he broke, somebody had broken into someone's house and stole a safe, broke the safe open and stole like a bunch of money, weed, and cocaine. Nobody had ever seen it before. We didn't know anything about it. I remember he was selling what he called nugs down at the Little Caesars Pizza for like five bucks. And they were like these big rocks, you know. Didn't care, didn't know anything about it. We got a hold of a huge bag of it. The rest is history. It was, I was like, why is this fun? Why do people find this fun? We kept trying it and trying it. The thing is that it brings you in even though it's horrible. And what I'm saying here is stay away from coke. It is a complete drag. It is the worst drug. I'm not going to say that there's maybe not a time and a place for everything, but the thing is, you know, if a person's buying it, it's it's a problem. And if you're buying it more than once a year, let's say, um, to each his own. But we all know the dangers of cocaine and crack. Um, amphetamines, on the other hand, they're longer lived and they're cheaper, therefore People love them, especially if they can't afford other drugs. And amphetamines, unfortunately, methamphetamine is one of the most horrific, disgusting things that you can do to your body. It eats you up, you know, it rots your body, it rots your mind, it causes you to do things that you would have never done. And fortunately, I didn't fall into that trap deep, but I'm not going to say I didn't have my day. And um, I would never stole from people or, you know, ripped copper wire out of houses or anything, fortunately. Um, but that happens a lot faster than people realize. And amphetamine, even though the opioid crisis is a huge issue, amphetamines aren't even a problem. Uh, I mean, uh, amphetamines are a bigger problem in Portland right now for overdoses and people being admitted to hospitals than opioids are. And that brings me to opioids, the next one. I'm going to be straight honest. I've learned a lot about opioids over the years, especially as a Kratom vendor and as a person who has lost a family member recently and who understands the treatment system and who has met a lot of people when I was in treatment. They are a travesty. I had a close friend who almost died, you know, when he was in his 20s because he was partying too hard, drinking, taking opioids, especially when you're, you know, it's one thing to take pills and then you start shooting up. Well, some of these um, combinations can just be so much more addictive than even heroin. You know, taking large Oxycontin doses is, you know, what led us into this crisis. But it's a modern crisis. It's a repeat of what's happened in the past. It happened after the Civil War when soldiers came back. Um, the morphine addictions. So, anyhow, the blame is everywhere, but the addiction is there, is the point. I wasn't really introduced to opioids in my teen years, and I'm so grateful. I remember trying trying it with one person once. I remember taking Vicodin a few times. I remember smoking H once with some dude that I knew, and that was when I was in my early, early I think 20 or so. Um, didn't enjoy it, and I, I mean, I just don't want to go there because they're so addictive. 
The idea that when you first try heroin, it is so pleasurable that you never want to get away from it, that should be enough to stop you in your tracks from trying it. So if you're one of the ones out there who's fortunate enough to have never tried heroin, please do not. Please don't think that you can try it once and never try it again. Is it really worth it? Well, that's up to you. I'm 44 years old, I've been partying for, you know, what, 30 years, and I still refuse to ever touch that stuff, you know? Just be smart. And I also don't touch the white ones, you know? It's been a very long time, I've been fortunate. I remember this old Snowbud comic, it was, you know, st hit the bong, you can't go wrong, or stick to the bong, you can't go wrong. Snowbud was a local band here in Portland, it was Snowbud and the Flower People. They sung about weed, and they put out this comic book with them, and it was a pretty absurd comic. I've got a copy I'd love to share with people, but you can probably look it up online. Um, <clears throat> they were talking about, you know, how cocaine's a drag, and, and stick to the bong, you can't go wrong. And it, it's, I remember this line that says, yeah, cocaine will turn an average citizen into a desperate, pathetic, begging, groveling fiend. And it will. I've personally been wronged by two people who were on amphetamines, and um, or and or coke and stole personal family heirlooms, then returned them, then stole again. It's a vicious circle where you feel bad for people. They do the wrong thing, but you forgive them. And I'm sure a lot of you have family members who have been there. So um, years later, I started. I, in the meantime, had taken mushrooms several times when I was younger. But it wasn't until after I met my wife and we started, you know. Uh, got our life established, started going to shows again and stuff, and I started taking psilocybin mushrooms. I'm going to say that this is how I'm going to finalize this video, is talking about psychedelics. You know, I was introduced to DMT when I was about, I think I was 19, and some guy brought some home, and uh, we tried it, and I just remember we were looking out the window, we were just tripping, like we ended up in a different room afterwards. We should have known to lay down and chill and really get into the experience, we didn't know any better. Didn't know how long it lasted, didn't have any info about it. Didn't try it again for like 15 years. And then was introduced to it at Soak, the regional Burning Man. And I started buying it by the gram in little vials. It was uh, Mimosa Hostilis, the red stuff, you know. Um, amazing experience. I would have these moments of, oh, whoa, whoa moments. DMT, or dimethyltryptamine, is the same ingredient that's used in ayahuasca, which is one I haven't tried. But the DMT experience itself, smoking it, is so intense. I won't even smoke it when I have it. I'm not that interested in it. It is a very overwhelming sensory experience, but I don't feel like I gained anything from it after the first while. So, back to the point of psilocybin. I think that LSD, for me, ended up lasting too long. If I'd take it in the afternoon, evening, it would still keep me up really late. And I like my sleep. I like a normal schedule. But I enjoy taking it at night. Uh, DMT is too short, of course, and likes to take ayahuasca, which you're probably going to vomit. Psilocybin mushrooms seem to be the perfect human companion. You can take a small amount, 2 grams, 3 grams, which is a large for some people. Um, lay down under the stars, have a wild experience with some people or by yourself, whatever you prefer, and uh, have some deep insights and then get to sleep at a decent hour and wake up feeling great the next day. That to me is why I love psilocybin. Hopefully the mushrooms are somewhat fresh because once they get old it'll make you more tired, but some people like that too. Um, I'm trying to cover all the bases. Psilocybin is one of my favorite companions, but I very much enjoy LSD when I'm at uh, you know, a party, a dance thing, the Burning Man Regional. On a final note, um, <laughs> there's also other ones like I Ibogaine, made, you know, Iboga, which uh, people take when they're trying to quit opioids. And one dose of Ibogaine can actually help cure some people from addiction, um, or maybe a couple of you know, ceremonies, but it can be dangerous, and I'm not familiar with it personally of taking it, so I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, <clears throat> as far as the psychedelics, the last one I'd like to cover is MDMA. Now, a person may not... LSD, mushrooms, all these things may... these may be much too intense for a person. 
but a lot of people do need healing. And MDMA has the most promise for people who need to heal from a, a PTSD, any type of traumatic event. I should say, soldiers like to call it PTS, not PTSD. I guess they've dropped the D because they say that's bullshit. It's not a disorder. It's post-traumatic stress. Whenever you have a stressful event in your life, you're going to have, you know, feel trauma because of it. It's going to be tough to overcome sometimes. MDMA or, you know, uh, basically Molly or ecstasy, as it was called, uh, can be very useful in treating that. Unfortunately, it has a bad history because a lot of people have uh, considered it to say, well, it kills people and people overheat. Yeah, some people have taken bad product or gone to raves. Often they mix it with speed, but if you get pure MDMA by itself, it's very relaxing, a very amazing experience, and it can help you process a lot of things. But most of all, process things with other people around you. It lowers your walls, lowers your barriers, and allows you to be more empathetic with those in your life, whether they're present or not. And that has been a huge tool for people in my personal life that I know. I never tried it. I was offered it several times. I never tried any ecstasy until I was in my mid-30s. And I took a tablet, didn't like it because it was mixed with speed. I could tell it wasn't strong enough. I was like, I'm going to wait until I know somebody who knows a chemist or whatnot. And eventually I was able to obtain real product, but I wasn't that in a hurry. Because of the main rule that I want to point out about Molly. MDMA was brought back into the limelight by Alexander Shulgin. And him and his wife, Ann Shulgin, lived in a cabin and he was a chemist. He made a lot of interesting psychedelics and compounds. But he kind of brought MDMA back and 2CB as well, which is another one I have tried, which is kind of a com it's kind of similar to LSD, but more shorter acting and more mellow. It's hard to explain. Uh, but he brought MDMA back, and his wife Anne wrote in a book, a journal. She she was talking on a documentary too about it. She started taking 100 milligrams or so, like every week for about a year to help her with her artistic endeavors to go in and she'd paint or write whatever she did. She said after about a year she was getting no effect and then it's continued. And what it seems is that MDMA has diminishing returns. And I know some people who discover it, maybe take 100 milligrams, think this is fantastic. And the next thing you know, they're like, oh, I'm going to drop a half a gram or I'm going to take a whole gram. And I just facepalm. I mean, I just, I've talked to, you know, several people who brag about taking huge amounts say you don't understand. That's like the guy who brags about taking a 10 strip of acid or a sheet. You're dumb if you do that. You also don't need to take a 30 gram dose of mushrooms. You know, you can stay within the realms of what's going to be beneficial. Let me just put it this way. Every medicine has an active range of benefit. And if you take too much, you're not getting that benefit. Psychedelics are the, are the same way. We just haven't identified that yet. Unfortunately, Johns Hopkins University is doing a lot of research on psychedelics now. And um, so we're learning a lot more about things. And um, so I just wanted to share my story, my history. I've also, I guess to bring it to the modern day, I still smoke cannabis. I never drank alcohol until a few years ago. I, maybe a, a six pack or a fifth when we go camping or something. Honestly, just knew better. But there have been some hard times in life, and so you have a few drinks, you justify it. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself an alcoholic, and I don't get the spins or get drunk, but I found myself drinking more than I used to. And it's easy to fall into that one, because alcohol seems like the acceptable drug. When you're talking about drugs, you have to bring that one up. Alcohol is not acceptable. It has its moment, but drinking regularly is dangerous to the liver and the body, Several, you know, there, there's no way to, no way shape about it, you know. Um, and especially when you're mixing it with pharmaceuticals, which is something that I've seen with people. I still think cannabis is relatively safe. I think psychedelics, in my opinion, should be used in moderation a few times a year, maybe four times a year maximum. And um, I think once a person's had a breakthrough on psychedelics, they tend to want to go, wow, and try that again, but eventually you're just, you've seen what you need to see. And then you just need to re-see it. Once you've learned a lesson, 
all you have to do is kind of reread that book. And that's how I feel about tripping again. It's like, oh, okay, yes, we are all one. Everything is connected, and it doesn't matter the, the haters, the doubters about existence and, and why, you know, purpose of existence. You find yourself just not caring about that. You like, it's very difficult to explain until you've been there. But, um, and I'm not talking about God or religion here. I'm, I, it's something much deeper than that. Um, you see that universal bond in a way that you can't explain in words. And uh, I'll leave it at that. So that was useful for me. And today I keep it cool. Now that cannabis is legal in my state, Washington, I'm lucky. Um, you know, we just do what we do. Try not to use too much. And I would say just be smart. Don't use too many drugs. My camera's about to cut off, so I better get going here. And uh, thanks for watching. I'll talk to y'all soon. Be safe. Be safe. Peace. Listen to the water.